Welcome to Off the Clock, the webcast of employment attorneys at Miller Johnson, where we discuss what is happening in the HR world and provide practical insight and advice. We are your co-hosts, Rebecca Strauss and Sarah Willey, two employment lawyers who spend their days guiding employers through all of the challenges that workplaces offer. Well, good morning, Rebecca. Good morning, Sarah. How are you? I am excellent. We've got our new chairs here today. I know. New it's setup. What do you think? I love it. Yeah. Uh, we've definitely upgraded, right? And yeah. that's because so many people are listening and watching, right? We've decided to invest, right, in making it a little more uh, better on camera. But folks can also listen to us just on the podcast, right? right? Yep. Yep. Just a, re a reminder for everyone, you can... Listen to us on any of the podcast apps. Um, as you're going about your busy life, you don't have to be in front of a computer to watch to watch us talk to each other. You can just <laughs> hear our voices. So, And I will speak on behalf of myself only. I prefer you not to watch me. <laughs> I would be, do me a solid and just <laughs> listen to the podcast, and I would just feel so much more comfortable. I personally recommend it just driving to work in the morning. Right. right? It's a perfect time. Right. Okay, so let's get at it yes. because there is, in the employment law and HR world, there is one topic that everyone is talking about and for good reason. And what is that? Vaccines. Vaccines. And, yes. and in particular, vaccine mandates, right? Yes. Whether to mandate them, when to mandate them, how to mandate them, the exemptions that might apply, et cetera. And then, of course, layered on top of that conversation, as of recently, are the um, federal executive orders and the OSHA emergency regs, et cetera, um, requiring um, many, if most, if not all, businesses to have some sort of uh, vaccine or testing requirement. Right. So we started seeing our healthcare employers, right, a little while ago on the front end of this, mm -hmm. uh, mandating the COVID vaccine, but now it's everyone. Sure. Now healthcare it's everyone. and higher ed, I yes. think, were the first couple of okay. industries that uh, we were working with directly on vaccine mandates. And now it's exploded, right? right. So, yeah. so the questions we've been getting, and when I say we, it's not just you and I, it's really the entire firm, is about a lot about the process as it relates to exemptions. Yeah. And now we have a lot of experience with this because we work with healthcare providers who for a long, long time have had flu vaccine requirements, mm -hmm. right? And they have gotten requests over the years uh, for people who say they cannot get the flu vaccine because right. of a medical point. issue or religious accommodation. We've worked you know, through the process with those folks, but for most of our clients, most of our healthcare clients, they haven't had to deal with requests for religious accommodations very often, have they? Outside of, do you mean outside of a vaccine yes. mandate, whether it's flu or COVID? That's exactly yeah. right. I, I would say outside of vaccine requirements and outside of COVID, what I'll call COVID times. When we talk to businesses and clients about reasonable accommodations, it's almost always in the context of, a, of an accommodation that's been requested for a disability, right? Yes. So that analysis is under the ADA. It's much less frequent that we get questions about religious accommodations under Title VII. So with regard to the COVID vaccine, um, I would say, employers are already um, at a bit of a, a disadvantage or feeling on their heels a little bit because that religious accommodation is not something that they're necessarily readily familiar with or have a tremendous amount of experience with. Maybe they got a request three years ago, but it's not something that they have a process in place to address or something that they have handled um, multiple times. And when it comes to employees requesting exemptions from mandatory vaccine policies, we're seeing the bulk of those requests being made as religious accommodation Definitely. requests, right? Definitely. Yeah. 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 It, at least as they get to my desk, right? I mean, it I could agree. be the case that more people are requesting exemption due to some sort of disability and maybe um, businesses feel more comfortable handling that without having to call a lawyer to ask questions. <laughs> um, but... I, Which the, we don't recommend. <laughs> the, the, 
the vast majority of questions. Call Oliver. <laughs> the vast majority of the questions definitely have to deal with those religious exemptions. Okay, and so what? What I would love to do is for our audience today, for our listeners, help them really think through a process that's step by step, and have a list of what they should have ready to go, what, yes. what they should be putting together. Because um, I, what I'm seeing is a lot of sort of paralyzed panic, right? Correct. I don't know, oh my goodness, um, we're going to mandate this vaccine and I am anticipating hundreds of these requests coming in. What am I going to do? Yes. And so I think it would be great to kind of help people think through a structured step-by-step -step process and also make a list of what they should be, what sort of documents and things they should be thinking about preparing. So, so not shockingly, I agree. <laughs> so let's do that today. Let's start off before we get into that, and we promise you we will. Uh, let's just give the general framework. The background. Okay. What what do we need to be thinking about before we enter the process? Why do we have a process in the first okay. place? Good. And we'll go through that fairly quickly so that we can get to the step by steps. Okay. Okay. And, and and the takeaways. Yeah. So so generally speaking, there are two bases that employees can request an accommodation, right? There's one under the right. ADA and one under Title Seven right. for religious and, accommodations. Right. And right? to be clear for our listeners. Right. I think you know what I'm about to say. Right. <laughs> My usual reminder every time we talk to each other is. Does it have to do with the state? It has to do with state <laughs> law, of course. That's exactly right. So you should just record this and just insert it onto every <laughs> podcast so you don't have to say it right. every time. Right. So the good news for all of our listeners is we're not going to cover the laws of all 50 states, right? Okay. Um, so so we're talking broadly in terms of the federal law requirements. But of Correct. course, everyone who has employees in different states, which you all do, right? Whether it's in Michigan and whether it's in other states, you need to make sure that there's no unique state laws that also right. is are going to impact your analysis here. Absolutely. Okay. So let's get going just, that was a, a great caveat. So let's just talk about under federal law then. Right. What is, what is required? Let's start with the ADA and yep. what is required under the Ooh, ADA. So favorite. Sarah, I know you know this accommodation right. process. So, so what is, why can an employee request an accommodation and what are the standards sure. that an employer should be thinking about? Sure. So if an employee has what's called a disability, right? What's defined as a disability. Um, and by the way, that's much broader than many people might expect. It's mm -hmm. essentially any physical or mental impairment that either makes it harder for them to do something important in comparison to others. Um, and when I say important, I mean, really, that's pretty broad. That's any major life activity, right? So we're not getting too hung up. When, when an employee comes right. with a medical explanation... It probably is for why a disability. they cannot do something. Yes. We don't spend a whole lot of time um, uh, nitpicking through. Usually that. not, yeah. right? Um, and so, if they have a disability, if they come to an employer and say, "I have a disability, um, which is impacting my ability to do my job," right? Then we, um, the employer, might have an obligation to provide them a reasonable accommodation. Okay. Okay. Um, that triggers immediately. Um, a requirement that the employer at a minimum engage in what's called a reasonable accommodation process, right? To sort out what's your job, what does your job require, mm -hmm. uses this term essential job functions, uh -huh. um, and how can we help you? What are the options available for us to help you? Um, an employer, of course, never has to provide a reasonable accommodation if it would be an undue hardship to okay. that business, Okay. Got so it. when we apply that to a vaccine mandate, right, essentially what an employee is saying is, I have a disability and the accommodation I want is an exception to your rule, right, yes. is an exception to your mandate. That triggers then this reasonable accommodation process, right? We have to engage with them and we need to look at their job what their essential job functions are, and whether it would be an undue hardship to give them what they want, and also whether there might be alternative 
accommodations available. Got it. Okay. So someone could make a request under the ADA. They yep. could also make a request based on a sincerely held religious belief. Correct. Right? And that would fall under Title VII. And a sincerely held religious belief is actually quite broad, yeah. broader than what many of us think at first blush as to what might count as a sincerely held religious belief. Sure. So much like the ADA, I don't think it's worth spending a whole lot of time and energy uh, mm -hmm. picking that apart. Uh, now, if we get to litigation, of course, that's another issue. Right. But, but on the front end, when someone is making the request, it's probably safe to assume uh, for the purposes of that request only right. that it, it counts as a sincerely held religious belief. And, and when it comes to mandatory vaccines, something that employers are getting stuck on is they see leaders of major religious organizations saying the vaccine is fine. Get it. Like the Pope for instance, and right. the heads of large Protestant organizations. Mm -hmm. But then they have uh, employees who are followers of those faiths who say, but my sincerely held religious beliefs oh, say no. Right. And that still counts. You can be a religious believer of one, right? You can have a religion of one. You are the only person that holds that belief. You may be a follower of a larger mm -hmm. uh, faith community, but disagree with that faith Disagree community. with the Pope. You can be I a feel Catholic like I shouldn't address that Pope. specifically uh, under <laughs> Title Seven. However, allows under that. Title Seven, you can. Right. Yeah. So you're it's between you and <laughs> yes. But, but yes, under Title Seven, you can say, "I know." Uh, an employee can say, "I know the Pope has said uh, that he encourages followers to get the vaccine, but I don't think that I should because of the way I interpret the tenets of I my see. faith." Okay. Uh, and that would count under Title Seven. So. This is why uh, we don't spend a whole lot of time, right? So just like under the ADA, we say if it's related to a medical issue, we're probably just going to go to step two, which is the accommodation process. Mm -hmm. Same under the religious yeah. accommodations. So then the rules for what we do with a request for a accommodation under uh, Title VII religion, the words are very similar <laughs> to the words to the that ADA. we use in the ADA process, but they have a different meaning. Right. Which is really confusing. Yeah. Right? I feel like we should apologize on behalf of the court <laughs> and Congress. Who yeah, I think it's Congress's fault, things. right? Because they use the same words, but they've been interpreted by the courts in a different way. Yes. And so the takeaway with that, if our clients remember anything, it should be this. Undue hardship under Title VII for a religious accommodation is a much lower standard than it okay. is under the ADA. So employers have to do less to Correct. accommodate, right? Yes. It's easier for them to show a request would be an undue hardship. Employers under Title VII for religious accommodation requests uh, have to accommodate uh, accommodations, have to provide accommodations that would be, that would not have them incur anything more than a minimal disruption, okay. minimal. So if it's minimal or less, you should do it. If it's anything more than that, you don't have to. And okay. anyone that's worked through the ADA process, at least if they've talked to us as they've worked through it, knows that the burden under the ADA is greater, right? Okay. You might have to spend a little money, right? You might have to change a few shifts. You might have to change a schedule, et cetera. Under Title VII, you do not. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So even though the term undue burden is the same and reasonable accommodation is the same, uh, the way we think about how much trouble the employer has to go through, how much burden the employer has to take on is very different. Okay. But the process is the same. Got it. Right? Do you agree with it? Is the process the same for both types so. of requests? I think so. Yes. I mean, there's different uh, forms and documents you can request depending on whether it's a request for a, 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 due to a disability or, right. or religious belief. but. I think that's right. I think the, f the general framework is the same. Your flow chart, so yes. to speak, is the same. Okay. Um, so should so we let's, do the process? Yes. That's what let's everyone talk wants about to, the process, right? Wants to know. And let's just, let's just do it like, let's just bounce it back and forth, right? Okay. Remember in elementary school, we used to play that game with stories where one person would say a sentence and then the next person in the circle would add okay. the next sentence to the story Excellent. and then the next. So let's just start off with, um, before you even get a request... Okay, can we just even back it up? Yes. So we're going to start our process, our, our flow chart, if you will, uh, even before your first request comes in. 
Why don't we just start with, I'll, I'll do number one. Okay. Okay, because it's easy. <laughs> I'm going to pick the, the easy one. Leadership at your organization has decided that your organization is going to require employees to receive the COVID-19 mm -hmm. vaccine. Okay. Period. There's not one of these options where vaccine or testing. That is the policy uh, stated in very general terms, right? And they have called you into the leadership meeting and said, make it so. Right. <laughs> right. This is what we want to do. You make it so. Okay, so that's step one. That's what happened. What is the next thing that our HR folks should do? Oh, it's my turn now? Oh, yes. Okay. So <laughs> I think that they need to determine who in the organization is going to be in charge of this process, mm. right? Um, the same person or people, depending on the size of the organization, should be intaking, well, should be rolling out the policy, yep. intaking the, the requests for accommodations and making the decisions. So who is that going to be? And then of course that should be communicated internally to, to leadership so that yes. then leadership can send employees to the right place. And in many places it's going to be the human resources department, but then even within that department, right. you, who, who there is going to be in charge of this. Perfect. Okay. okay. So we've got the request from leadership. We went to you with uh, naming the person who's going to be responsible. Back to me, I would, I would add on to that. Come up with the policy. Yes, policies. Right, next. and I know. Let me just pause here to say, as much as HR loves a good policy, and as much as we do, uh, I've already seen this step being skipped because everyone's in a hurry. Right. People are in a hurry, but please don't skip this step. Right, and it's not to paper a file or anything like that. It is so there is clarity mm -hmm. amongst the HR staff, leadership, and employees. There are right. going to be a lot of questions. This is one of those policies people may actually read. <laughs> right? It's a valid it's, point. it's not a policy just for the sake of having a policy. Yeah. There needs to be clarity, and in working through, I've seen this with the clients that we've worked on these with, by working through yeah, the various tenets of the policy, mm -hmm. it forces HR and leadership to think to through. To actually yeah. think through. Because once the requests start coming in, you're going to have to act quickly and you're going to have to know as many answers as you can beforehand. So uh, a good policy. Okay. What do you have after that? What would you add on? So a good policy and then um, a process by which you understand and collect information about who's vaccinated or not, right? You've got to know whether employees okay. have complied with the policy. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. And how, do you have recommendations on how to do that? Are you recommending that clients get the documentation, that wonderful card, right, that we all laminated? Um, <laughs> For those of us who have been vaccinated. I see a, I see a mix of just a general attestation saying, okay. yes, I've been fully vaccinated and not requiring a copy of the card okay. to avoid that confidentiality of medical information floating around. Um, and then some employers are requesting a copy of the card. Either one is perfectly lawful, quite So frankly, employers have the a VADA. choice. They have a choice. Okay. That's I've, exactly I've right. gotten that question quite yeah. a bit, actually. Yep. Okay. Yep. So you got to know, you do have to know at the outset, how are you figuring out how you're going to determine who's compliant with the policy and who's not? Yep. Good. Okay. My add to that is inform leadership and employees of the process for requesting an accommodation. Okay. So now okay. we're getting into the exemptions accommodation piece. Yeah. Yep. So you're going to have the, you, you've got the direction from leadership. You've gotten the policy. You now know who's already been vaccinated, right? Now you're going to tell, you're going to inform, obviously your employees, that this policy has been adopted. And now you're going to inform them uh, if you believe you need an accommodation to this policy. Right do the following one two three four five right okay and i believe the more transparency and information that is shared the better uh, it okay. will relieve a lot of anxiety amongst your leadership remember who are going to be on the front lines mm -hmm. right uh with receiving complaints and what about this and what about that and i find that when clients are anxious or nervous or maybe feel a little 
uh, unsettled because it's an area they haven't worked with before. They, they limit information they give because they're afraid of saying the wrong thing, right? And then right. don't worry about it. You can always tweak the process later. But I do think it's very helpful uh, for employees to know that if they make a request, for instance, uh, and we're going to go through the rest of the process of what's going to be part of this communication, but you may ask for follow-up information. They should know that when they make a request, right? right? So that they can intelligently make the decision about whether to make the request. They should know that not every accommodation request will be granted, right? They should know how the communication flow is going to work, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so the next step, I get my add-on to yours is communication to employees and leadership about what the process will be uh, for making exemption requests. And that's, do you, you do see that? that being done in writing or is there talking points? How do you see that? I How would, do you think that should be done? I would certainly do it in writing, but if you want to have town hall style uh, yeah. meetings, everyone has a different style, right? And some people are still virtual and, and some are not, so communication is tough, right, during COVID time. Okay, so but, as we're thinking about the list of takeaway, the list of documents that our listeners are yes. are having the to, checklist. we've got a policy. Yep. And we've got a, some sort of communication to employees and leaders about the process by which they can request accommodations. Yep. Right? Yep. Okay. I'm keeping a tally in my head as we go. <laughs> we'll summarize at the end, okay. too. So I think with that, the next step to me is somebody makes a request, yeah, right? Somebody comes forward and says, I'm not vaccinated and I'd like to request an exception to this requirement based on either a disability or, or a sincerely held religious belief, okay. right? Yeah, all right, let's bounce it back even faster now because now we're just gonna walk it through. What okay. would actually happen? A request is made, uh, the employer, the HR department, assuming they're the ones responsible for, right, for, for implementing the process would then provide that employee a request form. Yep. Okay. So there's going to be separate forms. You can have one form for a medical request and one form for religious request. You can have uh, one single form maybe, but that has different options. But there is a form that we can help folks design that asks the specific questions and then the person um, has to sign attesting that what they are saying is truthful. Okay. Okay. What happens after they, assuming they fill out the form and, and Return it to HR. What do you think should happen next? Then I think HR reviews that and determines whether they've made it through that first hurdle of do you have a disability or do you have a sincerely held religious belief. Um, If the request is based on a medical issue, an impairment, a medical impairment, then you could require them to have a medical provider complete a form verifying what their impairment is and that it prohibits them from receiving the vaccine. And even requests for religious accommodations, there is some follow-up you can ask about, right? Yes, you can ask. We can help you with it. You can ask the employee to provide um, explanation as to what their religious belief is Mm -hmm. and um, also information demonstrating that it's sincerely held, right? That yes, Okay, so my religious belief is X, and here's how I can show you that I really believe that to my core. Got it. Okay. All right, back to me. So now we HR has looked at the request, has asked for follow-up documentation if appropriate, yep. and has determined whether a valid request has been made. If the answer is yes, then my add-on is HR should think about, can we accommodate this request, or does it provide an und- or does it require us to incur an undue hardship again recognizing that term is different whether it's a medical request or a religious right based request and the types of things that employers should think about are very individual right based on that employer and what they do and what that employee's specific job is and maybe even how far away they work from other individuals and whether they're right. remote and whether they're in the office etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's impossible for us to go through and kind of give specific guidance on that, but the types of things that employers should think about is, are they putting others' health at risk, patients, for instance, customers, coworkers? Is this accommodation gonna cost us money, right, if we, yeah. if we grant the request? Uh, I think they should think about the burden incurred by attendance issues, because unvaccinated people are required to quarantine still after they've been 
exposed, whereas vaccinated people are not under current CDC guidance, which we know can, can change. always change on a dime. Will um, change. So yes. I think attendance, that the impact on attendance is something mm -hmm. in this particular That's context that employers can think about a, a, as they think through these things. Um, and, and then we're, depending on the specific of that employee's role, right, there's probably other specifics as well. But you have to think about it on an individualized basis. If this employee, can we accommodate the fact that this employee will not have a vaccine, right? And again, a, a higher, you have to incur a higher threshold of inconvenience if it's based on a medical uh, reason than based on a religious reason. Okay. Right. So, and and okay. in, I think as part of that conversation too, you, you have to consider alternative accommodations, which could include requiring testing. That's a popular, that's what a lot of employers are right. going to or um, have the employee work from home if their job can be done from home, et cetera, mm -hmm. yep. okay? And again, to your point, that analysis is so different for a nurse providing direct patient care mm -hmm. on the pediatric floor, right? Yes. To, and let's just take it to an extreme, to, to children um, with cancer, right? right, yes. providing direct care to very, very vulnerable patients. That analysis is going to be completely different than it will be for um, in employees working in an, in an insurance office. Right, right. In, in their own private in office. Sit, in their the private office process. and comes in and sits at their desk every day. It right. just is. It just okay. is. So you really have to think hard about this. You do. And I, and, it, and I will say there are circumstances in which, particularly under Title VII, employers are going to be able to say no. Absolutely. And I, and I think there is a, an assumption, because we keep using this term exemption, right? There's this right. assumption that if I can just request it and show I have a religious belief, then my employer has to allow me to keep coming to work and doing my job, and I just don't have to be vaccinated. Um, and for some employees, for example, the, the, the nurse, right, on the pediatric floor, um, that's just not true. That's not the case. Do you agree with that? I, um, I agree with you so much. <laughs> I just agree with you. I so enthusiastically agree with you. I could jump this up and down. This is why we get along so well. <laughs> Jeff Haywood, our, our fantastic producer, right. actually told us, this is a true story, before we started recording, we, we could can't not jump, jump up, up and down we on can't the chairs. Jump up and down on the chairs. So <laughs> the only reason I'm not jumping up and down on the chairs is to keep Jeff Haywood happy. <laughs> if I could, I would. <laughs> and that is because I, I feel so strongly about that. Yeah. That I encourage employers to message that in their processing document that I mentioned earlier. I encourage employers to message that in the accommodation request form. Right. Right. And I also encourage employers. I'll just add on to your process. Okay. Wait, whose turn was it? I don't remember. It's your turn. It's my turn. Okay. So we've made a decision and now we have to figure out how, how we have to communicate that. it. Right. So here is my suggestion with the communication. If it is a no, okay, we cannot accommodate your request to be unvaccinated. If that is the conclusion that you have reached, I think you should, con I think employers should consider having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the employee before documenting anything and saying, this is the conclusion we've reached. Do you want to continue with your request for an accommodation? You can't do your job and be unvaccinated. Yes. Because I think a lot of employees think exactly what you just said based on bad information they've been getting on the internet or from friends, right? Mm -hmm. They think, okay, I'll make the request. And if it's a no, okay, I guess I'll go get vaccinated, right? Uh, if it's a yes, I don't have to get vaccinated. If it's a no, I guess I'll go get vaccinated. But really, it's not that simple. They have put in writing and signed right. attesting to its truthfulness that they cannot get vaccinated. Right. Yeah. So if we deny that accommodation, that means they lose their job. And with this tight labor market, right, I don't think that's what we want to do. Right. And also knowing that the reason some employees have pursued the request in the first place might be inaccurate information right. that they have received. I think that the, the business 
uh, the right business decision is to have a soft conversation, and I think the right human decision is to have a conversation instead of saying simply request denied, your last day will be Friday. Oh, absolutely. Right? Right. Right. So, so, so the next step is communicating your decision to the employee, just to sum up what I just babbled about. <laughs> your next step is to communicate your decision with the employee, which can be a soft conversation before the letter uh, that goes to them, either saying yes or no, but whether you have that conversation or not, your decision should be documented and Correct. given to the employee and put in their file. And okay. to be clear, that decision next. could be no. It could be yes, or it could be something else, as as in we um, will allow you not to be vaccinated, but here is what you need to do in order to continue right. to work for us. We will offer you a different position that's not on the pediatric floor, right? Yep. Or you have to be tested every week, or you're going to have to work from home, right? Or you're going to have to take a leave of absence for a period of time, et cetera, right? Yes. There, so there could, that response could be more nuanced than a yes or a no. I agree. And I think that the communications also, particularly the yeses, or maybe I'll say yours, the yes ands, right? Either a yes or a yes and, uh, should include the caveat that the employer's decision could change as circumstances change, right? X, yes. If there's anything we've learned during COVID, right, is that the world can pivot on a day. It's not if circumstances change, it's when. Really. <laughs> right. Let's be honest. Good point. Like that. So that's the end of our flow chart. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, we talked a lot about this checklist, right? Yeah. Then about what what listeners should be thinking about gathering together. So yes. so should we just go through that checklist quickly with people? Yes, and I would say, to put a finer point on it, uh, the moment you catch wind <laughs> that your leadership team is going to be having a meeting yes. and begin, may begin and may adopt a mandatory vaccine policy for your start place this. of employment, start doing these yes. things. Okay, because so, you're, you're going to want to have these things out immediately. Okay, so we had a policy. Yep. Correct. We had a communication to employees and leaders yes. about what this requirement is going to be, right? Are we both counting on the phone? Yes. I keep, I'm double checking. Them. Okay, good. You're double counting. <laughs> this is counting. how lawyers double check me. <laughs> it's, like Santa, it's like Santa Claus. <laughs> He's checking his list. Our CFOs that are listening are cringing right now. Yes. And for those who are just Third. listening, we're using our fingers. <laughs> Third. <laughs> I don't have my calculator. <laughs> we are we need a request we form. Coming. Yes, maybe two. Maybe two. Dep you might want right. to consider separate request, ones Request on form reason. with an S in parentheses. Yes. 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 Uh, fourth, we need um, the ADA medical verification form yes. for the accommodation. Fifth, you want a form to use to require an employee to provide more information about a sincerely held religious belief if you want to do that. Fifth, you want sex. a oh, sex. Sorry, CFOs. <laughs> we need a communication granting the request. We need a communication denying the request. Yeah. And we need a communication with something in between. The yes, yes and or the or the no but, whatever you want it, whichever <laughs> you want to call it, right? I like the yes and. I like the positivity. Of the yes and. I like that. And yeah. I'm going to add another thing that I just thought of as we were talking this through, and that is if I'm an HR person, I would want to be looking at the positions within my organization and starting to and start to get my head around how I think we are likely to respond to an accommodation request for those different categories hmm. of positions, right? Um, to begin to prepare myself so that when, yes. and let me just say this, guys, uh, to our listeners, when you roll out a mandatory vaccine policy, the very that same day, you will get a huge amount of requests. Yes. 
You, okay, so start to think. You should through. not have other projects you're planning to complete. Though that's it. That's exactly right. You should not be doing your handbook revamp. Yes. Uh, so that's do the homework. Right. Start policy. that thought process yes. now. Right. If I'm a healthcare facility, let's begin to categorize in different buckets: direct patient care positions, office positions, home health positions, etc., and start to think about how we might be responding to those requests and what our options might be for each just just roughly on on a from that from that standpoint same with manufacturing i think that's brilliant and i have also seen clients set up almost default responses allowing for individualized acceptance of mm -hmm. course but in the healthcare context, which again, they're, they're they're on the front lines with this, right, and requiring right. vaccines, so they would say direct care, right, right, of vulnerable patients, like on the hospital floor, right. for instance. If you're in a hospital in a hospital room, you are mm -hmm. vulnerable almost by definition, and so unless there's an individual circumstance that directs us otherwise, we're probably going to say no. You need a vaccine, or you're going to have to find another position here, right? right? But we're not going to allow you to be unvaccinated in that role. So. So having those kinds of defaults will speed up uh, yes. a lot of the process, but you do need the escape valve. You do need to allow yep. uh, the opportunity for individuals to explain why in their particular circumstance that default doesn't make sense. You got it. And I also think it could help save time to prepare the yes, yes, and, or no letters for specific categories mm -hmm. of folks, specifically for our clients that are going to be dealing with large volumes. Yes, definitely. Uh, our, our larger employers, yep. right? They're going to be getting hundreds and hundreds. A small employer with two requests is a little easier, right? Agreed. Um, yeah. Our larger clients already, our larger healthcare clients are inundated. Yep. And um, to your point, lastly, uh, I think that would be 10. Um, set aside extra staff time, extra HR staff time to deal with this for about two to three weeks. That's really, really good advice. Bring in extra help. So you can deprioritize maybe yeah. some projects that is, is our HR leaders should help the rest of the HR staff uh, prioritize or deprioritize accordingly because this is going to be time intensive. Yep. Right? But then right. it will pass. Excellent. Okay. Well, we covered a lot in a short amount of time. So. We did, but Sarah, this is probably one of the most timely and helpful podcasts we've done. People really need to feel comfortable that they've got this. Excellent. Right? Uh, we can't give you all the answers for every request, but you've got a process now and you know what to do, hopefully. All right, all right I'll see you next okay. time. Until next time. Bye, Rebecca. Bye.